afternoon. Um, I'm Jay C. Lam from Krishna Medical College, Verlo. I'm very happy to introduce Professor Srikant Bangdiwala. He was earlier the Professor of Biostatistics at the University of North Carolina, the Biostatistics Department. Um, he was our teacher, mentor, and guide for so many years, over two decades, he has been helping us in um, uh, clinical epidemiology and biostatistical methods. Now, currently he's working as a, a statistical director at the Population Health Research at McMaster University. He's also attached to, uh, as a professor of biostatistics at the Department of Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at the McMaster University. He's a very, very busy person. He's a chair for many of the data safety and monitoring uh, uh, try studies uh, all over the world. And in spite of his busy schedule, I requested him to take these lectures for the uh, ISMS members and Clinical Epidemiology Network members. And this will be a useful lecture for the beginners as well as the senior members who can see how he is delivering the material, which we all teach sometimes, but you see the quality of teaching that will be useful for us to take it forward in our teaching as well. Uh, without uh, standing in front of him, I request Dr. Srikant to do this lecture. He's going to do this lecture for the next three days. Thanks, Khan, for agreeing to help us in the society. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Jay Seeland, uh, for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited to uh, talk to the Indian Society for Medical Statistics on a topic that I think is uh, a very important, interesting application of statistical methods, and that is on the uh, design, conduct, and analysis of clinical trials. So there's uh, the material, the amount of uh, things that I could be talking about usually would take over an entire semester. So uh, bear with me, we try to condense it to uh, just three lectures. Uh, and so we may not be able to cover a lot of the topics that you're interested in, um, but uh, we will uh, attempt to uh, cover important aspects of it. Um, the series of talks are divided into three sections. Today, we'll be talking more about the basics of the statistical hypotheses and study designs. Uh, Tomorrow, we'll be talking more about some of the design aspects and conduct, and uh, then on analysis on Saturday. So um, what is so important about clinical trials? You know, we are all very used to observational studies, but trials is the term that we use for experiments. And so as doing an experiment is very different from an observational study where we're not intervening here we are intervening, they are inherently comparing, comparing one treatment to another, um, or uh, we call them interventions. The standard goal is to assess the value of an intervention. They are also, by definition, prospective studies. They are never done retrospectively. Um, they're so in that sense, they're like cohort studies but investigators are the ones that are assigning the exposures. That's the main difference between a cohort study. So the, the fact that the investigator is controlling who gets what makes it an experiment. They're very formal, they're very structured. There's a lot of bureaucracy, guidelines, rules that regulatory agencies across the world impose on clinical trials. And the reason for that is that clinical trials are ones that can change, potentially change medical practice. And so they have predefined hypotheses. There is a standardized protocol on how things are going to be done. And even the analysis is pre-specified at the beginning. So what is, um, why, so much formality. They're considered as the gold standard for establishing evidence of not just any relationship, but causal relationship. So this is maybe 
the holy grail of trying to of establish how there is a relationship between some exposure factor and a disease or a condition. So here, the terms that we use is you have an intervention, that's the exposure, um, and you have an outcome variable that you are trying to study and you want the relationship. Does the intervention cause the particular outcome? And it's a causal relationship so that if, that if the intervention happens, the outcome happens. And if the outcome does not uh, happen, then the intervention may not have happened. So it's an if and only if situation. So um, you may have heard about the research evidence hierarchy or triangle. And when we want to establish the causal relationship between some exposure and some outcome, you know, we could go with somebody saying so, uh, expert opinion, this is now considered ignorable evidence. Nobody pays attention to that as they used to many years ago. Um, if you're trying to do it, the next thing is look at case series, case reports, or series over time. But observational studies do provide evidence of a relationship. However, the observational studies, the evidence that they provide is not causal. They can tell us about, is there an association from a cross-sectional study? Case control studies can give us the strength of association. Cohorts can give us the development of an outcome and the incidence of the outcome. But when we have well-designed and conducted randomized controlled trials, that's when we can establish the causal association. But you notice here that I've only gone up to two. What is above randomized controlled trials? Well, a single trial may not necessarily be the one that can uh, establish the causal, causal association because it's not a definitive trial in the sense of it's not large enough, it doesn't have enough coverage of the population, uh, types of people with the condition. So when we have replication evidence through systematic reviews of multiple randomized controlled trials on the same subject, then we can really say that we have uh, the uh, established their association. And these things are systematic reviews that may result in meta-analyses, for example. So a little historical perspective, where do these things come from? We all think that this is very fairly new, but I just wanted to remind folks that way back about a thousand years ago um, uh, in the Middle East, uh, Ibn Sina, who was called Avicenna, actually introduced experimentation into medicine and the idea of a clinical trial. And some of the tenets that he has here, which I'm not gonna go into, um, about how the drugs can be tested and that it has to, you know, some of the ideas that he put down in his canon of medicine are actually what we use today <coughs> when we talk about clinical trials. Um, and so he talks about the experimentation and the quality of the drug and the time of the observation um, and that it has to be a common effect seen in everybody. So this is it's a very old concept. However, the first clinical trial on a novel therapy was not conducted on purpose, was unintentional. And this was done by a French surgeon in the 16th, oh, 16th century. Um, and this was for treating infections and battlefield wounds, but it was not a controlled experiment. Um, so people don't really call it the first clinical trial. The sort of the first clinical trial is attributed um, to um, <coughs> John Lynn, um, who treated scurvy in uh, the British Navy. And um, there were 12 patients that had scurvy and he randomized them. So he assigned them randomly to having a normal diet plus something else. And so some people, two, of, two out of the 12 got nutmeg spice, some got cider, acid, vinegar, but two of them got citrus, oranges and lemons. And he noticed after a short period of time that these people did not get uh, better, 
but these two immediately improved within six days and one in fact became the nurse for the other ones. So this is in the 1747 was, is considered the first clinical trial. Now, what we know today as clinical trials really started happening more in closer to the last century. First placebos were first used in 1863, and then in 1931, um, it was the first study with uh, treatment of tuberculosis is when they were first used in a trial. So it was in the 20th century. But the idea of randomization that's used by uh, all randomized controlled trials actually comes from the father of statistics, Sir Ronald Fisher, um, and who developed experimentation on plants, not on humans. And uh, he worked at the Rothamsted Agricultural Experiment Station and designed uh, experiments, developed the NOVA and uh, all of the concepts of statistical hypothesis testing, and also randomization, assignment of treatments, in his case, to plants. Um, but the use of medicine began after World War II in a uh, tuberculosis treatment trials that's now famous. Uh, it was done in the UK by the Medical Research Council. It was a trial of streptomycin for pulmonary tuberculosis. And so uh, from three clinics, people were randomized to streptomycin or usual care, and they were followed for six months. And then they said, well, the streptomycin reduced the outcome of death. And yes, there was a relative risk that was 0.2. So that was five times lower risk of death if you took the intervention. The outcome of uh, their x-ray improving was six times better. So this is considered the first randomized controlled trial in humans. Okay. So that's a little bit of the historical perspective that I like to sort of set the background on. So what is a clinical trial? And here's the definition. And the words that are in bold are very important. So first of all, it's a prospective study. It's never done retrospectively. Comparing the effect, you want to know what happens and value of one or more interventions, and have to be interventions, against the control. So there is always a control group in human subjects with a specific medical or health condition. So we're studying a particular condition and it's in humans. Yes, there is experimentation in animals and in laboratory situations, but a clinical trial, the term clinical trial is for experimentation in humans. And so it's to establish the, the causal relationship of an exposure on an outcome. And it is, you know, if you, you alter the risk factor, do you alter the occurrence of the event, okay? It's a powerful experiment technique for assessing the effectiveness of an intervention. Now, the fact that it's done in humans makes it be having ethical considerations at the forefront. So everything about a clinical trial is designed, the conduct and the analysis is actually grounded on ethical considerations, okay? So um, clinical trials are therefore considered very important but not everything is the best, right? So there's the good things about them and there's bad things about them. So yes, it is the gold standard, but some people say, oh, the only thing that works is a clinical trial. Everything else is, is meaningless. That's not true. Everything has importance, right? But this one is considered for establishing causal associations. It's favored by journal editors, uh, fine. It has careful standards of conduct and structure, but some people say it's very rigid. You don't have much flexibility whatsoever. Um, a good thing is that randomization handles confounding, which is one of the biggest problems in observational studies, that we have potential factors that can confound relationships that we're looking at. Um, we focus on totality of evidence. And what does that mean? That means that we're not looking at the effect of the intervention on one outcome, 
which is the primary outcome. We look at it on multiple secondary outcomes. And we also look at it on not causing adverse effects or adverse events. So we're looking at safety evidence as well as efficacy evidence. We look at it in total. We don't look at it just one way, okay? Uh, so many people call it the sexy design, but it is complex, costly, and because they're done in an experimental fashion, and to, in order to observe an effect, we limit things by that rigidity of the formal protocol. Things are done in this particular way, not in a very pragmatic way. We also limit who we study. So therefore, the generalizability is considered not so great. That's why replication in different groups is also very important. Um, the fact that uh, we have to do it this way is what makes it sometimes not considered a very cost-effective way of doing things, for example. Um, and then we have to come into consideration when we talk about randomization, is it ethical to randomize people to different interventions? Okay. So um, before we go on with aspects of design, Number one, it's hypothesis driven. It's based on a research question that is a hypothesis of something being better than something else. And that is what's going to guide the design, okay? We will talk about effectiveness versus efficacy. And uh, today I will be talking about the different hypotheses that we normally consider here, whether it's superiority, equivalence, or non-inferiority. When we describe a clinical trial, we talk about the PCOTs. So who is the population being studied? What is the intervention arm or arms? What are the comparison arms? And what is the outcome, right? Uh, what's very important is also the timing. How long does it take for the intervention to occur? Is it the intervention is occurring over a period of weeks, months, days, minutes? Uh, and also how long are you following people? Remember you're following people prospectively. How long are you following them? So there's the timing element. And then the setting, where is it being conducted? Is there in rural villages? It's an intervention that's being done in high level tertiary hospitals in uh, a capital cities, or is it being done where? Um, we will also be talking about um, sample size considerations. Uh, and how do we actually assign people or allocate people to the interventions? But I said that ethics drives everything, okay? And one of the things that it drives is actually, can I do a clinical trial for my research question or not? And so the reason, what enables you to do it is this concept of equipoise. And Equipoise in English or equipoise in French means equal positioning. So the, and we have to be genuinely uncertain regarding which of the therapeutic interventions uh, can, are possible. If one of them is already known to be better than the other, so one is better like this and the other one is here, then it is unethical to do a clinical trial comparing these two because we already know that one is better. They have to be equally positioned so that um, we can say, yes, it is justified to do a clinical trial. So what is, how do we establish clinical equipoise? This is a clinical argument that uh, the physicians, investigators will have to argue against the ethics boards that approve the conduct of the trial. This is not statistical. We statisticians don't have anything to do with this. However, um, we depend on this happening, right? Um, there's a great article um, on the ethics of clinical research that I would recommend that you read if you're interested in this concept of equipoise. The other thing of, is, can we use a placebo against this? So, Using placebos is a controversial topic. 
Um, so let's say we're going to randomize to placebo or drug is one, one way of using it. Another way of using it is that even prior to randomizing, we can uh, give people some placebo in what's called a placebo run-in. So before they get randomized, we see if people, if there's a placebo response, then placebo is a good thing to, if there's none, it's a good thing to use. If there's a placebo response, we may want to change the placebo. But people say, why should I use a placebo? If there's something that is already there that works, then um, it is uh, not considered ethical to give placebo that doesn't work, right? So if, it's, if there is some known effective treatment, one needs to use that effective treatment as the standard treatment and now we are comparing a new treatment against that one. Um, in fact, you know, there's some studies that say that 30% of all patients getting placebo actually improve, which is very interesting um, to, to worry about. So do we still do placebo studies? Yes, we do. Um, so if there is nothing that is available and it's a new disease or a new uh, uh, condition, and we don't know what there is, then it's ethical to do. A very good example of that is actually the study done by Pfizer on the efficacy of their New England Journal of Medicine in December of last year. And it was, you know, two arm, it was just vaccine versus um, placebo. Uh, randomized one-to-one, -one, multi center superiority study with over 43,000 people, okay? And um, this is just the abstract from it, but um, some of the topics that I'm going to be covering are related to this standard design. It's a very basic design, and it's a large, simple trial where the main thing that they were looking at is um, a particular outcome, and that was being hospitalized or, or not, or, or preventing COVID uh, infection, for example. And so uh, this is the type of things that people do. So it's a large trial. We will talk about where the statistics comes in here. Statistics comes in in the planning, in the designing of it, in the reducing of confounders and standardizing things so that the quality of the data for the outcome is perfect. And the analysis, especially if you have a very large trial, is very simple. So some of you that are interested just in how, is, how do we analyze the data for this, will find out that there is the basic analysis is actually incredibly simple in a well-designed study. In a poorly designed study, that it becomes very complex. But in a simple ones, I mean, in a well-designed and well-conducted studies, the analysis is actually quite simple. So I'm gonna go through the process of developing the trials um, and how we actually define the uh, uh, hypothesis. Let's start off that most of the clinical trials that we, statisticians working with physicians work on are related to interventions that are based on drugs. Clinical trial methodology applies actually to all sorts of interventions. So they could be educational interventions, they can be uh, dietary interventions, there can be physical activity interventions, there's all sorts of ones. However, the most common one in a lot of the methods have been developed are for drug development uh, trials. Um, this process of drug development is what uh, uh, is done by pharmaceutical companies. They start by you know, discovering what in vitro may work, they do animal models, but when they start going to studies in humans, they have this terminology of phase one, two, three, and four trials. Phase one trials are ones where they're looking at the clinical pharmacology, the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics of the 
and tolerability of the study. We look at uh, it um, as well. Phase two trials, they're looking at drug efficacy, and I'll define efficacy, but also which is the best dose to use. What we consider uh, randomized controlled trials is really, can somebody, everybody mute themselves, please? Um, the, what we consider as, as clinical trials are effectiveness trials. And these are large scale confirmatory trials. They also use the term of phase four trials for post-market surveillance. I don't consider these trials, they're really observational studies. The important thing to note is that in all of these, uh, it is, uh, excuse me, Dharmendra, can you please put yourself on mute? Um, all of these are concerned with safety. And this is of utmost importance. Safety is very important. So phase one trials are those that um, are, as I said, are looking at the first time it's done in humans. So they wanna know, is it tolerated? What is the maximum tolerated dose? And what is the optimal biological dose? Okay, so what do dosage is safe? Um, so they call it the first of human studies. They're usually small sample sizes. They do it on healthy volunteers. There's no control group actually. And so this, some people would call them, they're not really trials. These are just a, an experiment. Uh, because there's no control here, uh, but that's just the semantics. The focus is on safety and tolerability. And the main thing is they try to escalate the dose to see not only is it tolerated, but what is the maximum tolerated dose. So these are very short trials. They're done in a single place. They're done usually in secret by the pharmaceutical companies because they don't want their stock value to change by things not working and many things don't work, right? So they don't let this be known. So they're looking at the, the dose that is safe, that is efficient and that is reliable, okay? So they usually start with a safe starting dose and they minimize the number of patients treated at subtoxic doses. And then they start escalating rapidly if there's no toxicity, but then they escalate slowly if there's some toxicity. And then once they do that, they will start their next, maybe expanding the types of patients that they look at. So the question is in phase one trials, at what dose do you start? What are the endpoints that uh, you're going to be looking at? How many patients per cohort and how quickly do you escalate? So just to let you know the way they usually determine the starting dose is from based on animal experiments. So they've done animal experiments in, in mice, rats, monkeys, or dogs, and they've found out a dose there, then it's either you know, one-tenth for humans, they will start at one-tenth of the one uh, of the lethal dose uh, that killed 10% of the of rats, or one-third of the minimal toxic dose of larger animals. And there's all sorts of things that uh, people have come up with on um, the conversion factors between animal experiments and human experiments. Um, but in humans, then once you have your starting dose, you're trying to identify what's called dose limiting toxicities, um, which are the ones that are considered unacceptable, right? So you don't wanna go further than that. Um, and you, these are things that the clinicians and the uh, investigators defined before. But what the goal is to find the maximally tolerated dose. Why? Because that way then they will try to look at the efficacy of it. Um, now, the, how we define this is actually really inconsistently done. Different regulatory agencies around the world vary on this, but uh, sometimes it's a dose at which a third of the patients experience this uh, dose limiting toxicity um, in uh, groups of two or three people, et cetera. And they're still also looking at the pharmacokinetics, which is the drug metabolism 
how long does it stay in your blood system? How long does it, is it takes to clear it? What dose, maximum dose is attained in the blood because you may inject somebody with something, but it doesn't remain in, the, in their system. So how do they do these studies? Well, they, they classically start with three patients uh, or sometimes one patient per cohort until they see toxicity. And so they do these things. So they start with a dose and if they don't have toxicity, then they do it, a, um, they escalate the dose on those patients, then they escalate the dose, then they escalate the dose. But when they start getting these toxicities, um, then they may uh, not, uh, escalate the dose, but they see, oh, we got toxicities twice. So then we come down here and we recommend this one. Or there's all sorts of escalation patterns that people do, um, number of patients and how many have the toxicities. So if they have zero out of three, you increase. If you have one, well, you get three more patients at that same dose level. Um, if you have uh, a few more, then you increase, et cetera, and then you stop. And so when you start getting enough, you don't add more and you stop. So people sometimes will start with three or sometimes they'll start with one patient. Um, and if they get some toxicity, but it's only grade two, they will, there's all sorts of different schemes on this. But basically you can see that this is done very simply. It is um, no control uh, arm. So this is just basically what I would call an ex an experiment in humans and human volunteers. Okay, so maybe not really a trial. Um, so, do, in non drugs, do we do these sorts of things? Well, yes, we look at it. We may not even do, um, we do pilot studies, right? Because we don't do animal studies on these. Um, the idea comes from the literature. And we just look at safety, if there's a safety issue, but usually we just do phase two and three trials. And we don't do the phase one trials because we don't have toxicities expect, expected in other types of like education and nutrition uh, interventions. The difference between a phase two and a phase three is that we think of phase two of looking at efficacy and the term efficacy is different from effectiveness in that Efficacy is ideal conditions, okay? and effectiveness is real life conditions. So efficacy studies or phase two studies are done in situations where it is much more controlled. Um, it could be in a laboratory setting in a particular clinic, for example, where patients with the condition are under study, um, they may titrate the doses, looking at the efficacy of the dose. Um, and these tend to be um, looking also at safety endpoints and exploring the main question in phase two studies is how much should we dose the patient and whether it's drugs or the level of intervention. I want to do an intensive physical activity intervention or do I want to do a less intensive one? Do I want to do an intensive dietary restriction of fats or of sugars or whatever, or not? So these are done in those types of situations, but the difference between the dosing aspects of phase two and phase one is that you do have a control arm because your main outcome here is the efficacy. So, what they do is they see the dose of the intervention and the response, and we call this the dose response curve. Usually there's at lower doses, there's no response. And at higher doses, you have almost 100% response. So you want to know the shape and when does this happen, the sigmoid shape occur. So the, um, we also are worried about toxicity. At very high levels, you may, start getting some toxicity. So the range between efficacy and toxicity is also very important. So people like to know what, what is the range here and when this starts going up and when does toxicity start? Because even though you want great efficacy here, if you have some toxicity, that may be unacceptable, okay? So 
the issues in dose finding in phase two studies is you're looking at, um, and now not the individual responses, but you're looking at the global responses, the group responses. Um, and so trying to determine the range of doses to consider um, and what are you measuring, right? Um, so then we go to phase three studies. And so here, just to compare phase one, phase two, and phase three, this is not randomized, this is not controlled. So I don't consider them trials, I call them experiments. Two and three are really trials, they're randomized and controlled. Here, there is no blinding because there is no control. Here, they tend to be blinded. They prefer to be blinded in both situations to the extent that it's possible. All of them deal with safety. And safety, again, because this is in humans, it's of utmost importance. Um, here, the main focus is on tolerability of the uh, drug. Here, it is in what is the dose and what is the efficacy of different doses. And here is the effectiveness of the intervention. Okay, what is it like? Does it work in real life or not? Um, we don't try to use the term patients because not everybody is sick, but everybody is a subject or a participant. Some people like to use the word participant in the study. So people say subjects. Here, they're healthy volunteers. Here, they have the condition that you're studying, just like here. This tends to be done in a single center, as I said, also hidden from the uh, public. These are done in maybe one or two centers. These, because they tend to be larger, are done in multiple centers. And so this may be a few weeks, depends on you know, uh, what they're looking at uh, of the drug, because they're looking at blood issues. They may be in days or weeks. Um, this may be a few months. Uh, short-term efficacy, and this may be usually months or years, okay? So now I wanna move on to what are the different hypotheses that are tested in phase three trials? And uh, last one. And so, as I said, the study design is, or the randomized trials is hypothesis driven. The research question that the clinician investigator has determines the hypothesis that they have. Are they showing, wanting to show that something is superior, is a new treatment superior to the current standard treatment, or is it equivalent, or it's not inferior? And these are the three main ones that are looked at. And so what, what do we, let's define them and see what, what they are, okay? so. If the goal is to come, the goal is, is to compare two interventions. So let's keep it simple. A and B are the two interventions. So superiority is with the null hypothesis that there's no difference between intervention A and B on what? On a particular outcome. So you have to have a certain endpoint or outcome. You can have it one-sided or can be two-sided. But whether it's one-sided or two-sided, it's still called a superiority. So even if it's a difference, you're testing a two-sided difference, we call it superiority. It's just the terminology that people use. Equivalence is that the alternative hypothesis is that the difference between them is not big. That's what equivalent means. So they're not, the difference is smaller than some pre-specified gamma, okay? And that, who specifies that? Somebody has to specify that. Uh, it's usually the clinician, or it is many, many times a regulatory agency that determines what that is. Now, non-inferiority, um, and maybe it's this, I should have said that for superiority too, right? Superiority depends on whether the outcome is a good one or a bad one. Non-inferiority is dependent on whether the outcome is a good one or a bad one. So if it's a bad outcome, you want that the difference between the uh, treatments is less than, again, another threshold. We do use capital delta for it, 
um, that is again established by a regulatory agency and that that difference is no bigger than that threshold. And if it's a good outcome, that it's not worse than minus that threshold. And we'll, we'll make this a little bit clearer in a second. So let's, let's start off with um, superiority hypothesis. So a superiority hypothesis, um, well, of course, it depends on the type of variable. So if, we're, if its outcome is continuous, we're comparing means. And so we're looking at the means between the two intervention arms. Um, and we designed the study to detect the smallest clinically meaningful difference delta. And usually the 0.05 level with usually 80% or 90% power. But who determines the smallest clinically meaningful difference delta? Again, it's not the statisticians, it's the clinicians or investigators. What is clinically meaningful is a difference of point something or 2% important, or does it have to be uh, 3% for it to be considered important? So they have to determine what is meaningful or what is important and not, yeah, of course, the bigger, the better, but the bigger it is, the um, uh, easier it is. You don't need large sample size, but you want to find out what is the smallest meaningful one because that will give you then the necessary sample size in order to establish uh, um, the difference between them. So now the significance or not is really equivalent to having a 95% confidence interval and whether it includes uh, the value of zero, okay? So for example, uh, if we establish Delta here, and I'm just putting it as a, on a positive side here. Um, we want that um, if you have a significant difference, the lower value of the confidence interval does not include zero. If it includes zero, even if your point estimate is above zero, but if the confidence interval does include zero, then you didn't find a significant difference. Now, many times, most trials do not really look at continuous outcomes, they look at uh, binary outcomes. Um, oh, here's another two things. You know, they, we usually test against zero, but we maybe should be testing against what is meaningful. We'll talk about that in a second. But if the outcome is binary or time to an event, now we're comparing risks or hazard ratios. If, uh, if we're doing binary, we're doing risks. Uh, but if you are looking at survival data, you're looking at hazards over time. Um, and we, assuming proportional hazards, we can compare the hazard ratio. So now instead of comparing against zero, we're comparing against one. Um, and so now in that scale, we just have to all, again, we designed a study to detect the smallest clinically meaningful ratio delta. And so now we do it against one, okay. Um, and it's the same uh, interpretation of the result, okay. And again, we, we never test against one, we always test against one rather than testing against delta. So that's for superiority. So we either are looking at this clinically meaningful ratio delta and want it to be, we design it to be better than that particular value and get the sample size from it. But when we test against the null hypothesis value. Now, equivalence hypotheses are different, right? Because now we're trying to say that they do not differ by more than some pre-specified amount um, gamma. And for differences, it's that the means are less than, uh, in absolute, the difference in means is less than gamma or for ratios um, that it is between one over gamma and gamma. So when do we use equivalence hypothesis? Well, it's used actually in very limited situations nowadays. It's really in bioequivalence when they have two different formulations of some drug um, and they have equivalent pharmacokinetics. And it's, this is for, is used to say, okay, this approved drug is now, we are de developing a generic drug and it's equivalent in that, to the already approved one. So we wanna get our drug approved. So they're looking at equivalence of pharmacokinetic uh, 
parameters, and they call that bioequivalence. It's also when they're doing the production and they're having manufacturing of, let's say, vaccines or drugs, and they want to look at lot to lot consistency. They want to show equivalent immunogenicity of a vaccine. Um, and that's usually required for vaccine approvals. Or clinical equivalence is used to compare two or more treatments to see if they are the same. But to showing that they're the same is very different than showing that one is not inferior. And it used to be that people did clinical equivalence, but not that much now. They prefer to do non-inferiority, and I'll show you why. So for equivalent studies, you have to have your confidence interval, let's say for differences or for ratios, between minus gamma and gamma. And so even if it's better, but it is the other drug is the confidence interval crosses gamma, then you cannot say that there is equivalence. So even if it's better, you cannot say they're equivalent, right? So that's why they don't like to do equivalence. They prefer to do non-inferiority. Okay. The same thing applies here for ratios. So why do we do non-inferiority trials? Again, is we have a new test and there is an existing standard treatment. So we have a new thing and there's something existing or approved. And we want to show that this new one is not worse than that. And how, but you can tolerate a little bit of worseness, but not too much worseness. Okay, so examples, again, if we, um, if we have a new investigational treatment um, and you don't wanna show that it's necessarily much better than the existing one, you just say, well, it's, it's just as good as the other one. It's just, and it's not, so maybe just as good is another terminology for non-inferiority, um, or it's not less efficacious. So maybe it's less efficacious, but slightly less efficacious, okay? Uh, or maybe the dosing is, well, yeah, we've been giving this one here and this works if you give the dose of this amount. But if we give it likely less, it's not that much worse. So this is the type of thinking that a clinician may have that drives going to a non-inferiority trial. So people call this one-sided clinical equivalence. Okay? So it is like clinical equivalence, except that it's one-sided as opposed to two-sided. So now if we are better, then it's fine, right? Um, that's why you have this no worse. Um, so if non-inferiority is supported, we can actually subsequently test superiority if it's, uh, if it's possible. So nowadays, so what we do is since it's one-sided, we take that the alpha 0.05 and just do half of it. So now we're looking at one-sided, 97.5% confidence intervals, or you know, just use the limits of a 95% two-sided regular confidence interval, okay? And what you focus on depends on whether large values are harmful or beneficial, and whether you focus on, on the upper limit or on the lower limit. So let's look at it graphically. So if the outcome is good, and you have now the test versus the standard, of course, if the test is minus the standard is greater than zero, that is fantastic. However, you will tolerate a little bit worse. How much worse? Well, not so much worse, but some minus delta worse. So if now you construct the 95% confidence interval, but if it crosses minus delta, so the lower limit of the confidence interval is below minus delta, then you say inferior. If it is above minus delta, then it's not inferior. Even if the confident, if the point estimate is zero or even negative, as long as it is the lower limit of the confidence interval doesn't cross minus delta. And if you're so lucky that not only it is, doesn't cross minus delta, but it's on the other side of zero, you could say it's superior. In fact, if it was all the way over here, you would say it's meaningfully superior, for example. And the same thing applies for ratios um, with just changing the scale here on that side. However, if it's a bad outcome, then the difference between the test and the standard, you don't want it to be positive. 
you want it to be negative. But you will tolerate some positive, uh, slight amount of badness to it, but not too much. How much? Not much. Again, uh, now it's a positive delta. So you don't want the upper limit of the confidence interval to go beyond uh, delta so that it would be called inferior. You want it to be below delta so it's not inferior. And if you're lucky, you would have it to be superior, okay? So notice that in all of these graphs, I've kept this little delta and the gammas. And is there a relation between these? Are these margins related? Well, actually they are. Conceptually or common sense, logically, they should be related, right? Because to show that something is clinically better, you need to have something that is meaningfully better, and that's delta should be big. To show non-inferiority, you will tolerate something of differences between them, but not too much. So this delta is much smaller than the little delta. And then for equivalence, you want it to be even tighter, to be very, very similar to each other. So gamma is going to be usually smaller than the capital delta. So there is a relationship between them. So remember that to show superiority, we want the smallest clinically meaningful difference for being superior, something that the clinician determines. To show non-inferiority, we want the largest clinically tolerable difference to claim non-inferior. Capital delta is again determined by the clinician. And to show equivalence, we want the largest clinically tolerable difference to claim similarity, very slightly different than to claim non-inferiority. These two, as I said, well, all three are clinically determined, but these non-inferiority and equivalence for drugs are sometimes determined by regulatory agencies. Again, we statisticians deal with it after they've determined this in determining the sample size and in doing the test eventually at the end of the study. So common pitfalls that I think all of you statisticians know if, uh, so I don't have to say them, but I will because they're important, is that if you test for equivalence and you can conclude equivalence, that does not mean that if you had tested for superiority, you would not have found one, right? Because they're not equivalent hypotheses. And the same thing, if you test for superiority and do not find one, this does not necessarily mean you can conclude equivalence, right? Um, and remember that all of these things, uh, the significance is one thing, importance is another, they don't have anything to do with each other. So as I said, selecting the equivalence, not inferiority margins um, has to be done a priori before the study is designed actually. Um, and if you are working with the pharmaceutical companies, they know this because they want to get it approved by a regulatory authority. Um, and so historically, this was just set by clinically relevant differences um, of differences of means or percent differences, et cetera. And for binary outcomes, um, they usually do things um, on, a additive scale um, or in multiplicative scales of 0 0.80 or 1.25 for bad outcomes. So these are just the reciprocal in, uh, in a multiplicative scale. Um, there's a whole uh, topic of selecting the non-inferiority margin. I'm just gonna give you a quick example. Um, the, if you're interested in this, the US Food and Drug Administration in 2016 released a guidance for industry on how to establish uh, these margins and non-inferiority studies. And so their guidelines are this, this doesn't mean that it applies everywhere, but more, many people follow this, is that you find out what is the effect of control or standard, and then you determine the margin using this thing, um, looking at, preserving some of the benefit of the uh, effect in the control, okay? So you first have to determine this quantity called M1, and then you determine 
the M2, okay? And they call it the fixed uh, margin method. So what is, what do you do? You first have to do a review of the literature um, and find a 95% confidence interval comparing the reference to placebo. So what is the reference to placebo, right? And, or what has been done in the past? And it has to be against placebo. So once you get M1, that's the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval comparing the reference to placebo. And then to determine this margin M2, which is gonna be our delta, capital delta, they will set it at half of the lower side of the confidence interval to preserve half of the effect. Or you could set it to preserve 75% of the effect, but typically people do it half because that's the minimal acceptable one, okay? Um, but sometimes you, they may even want it to preserve more of it. So how does this actually work? So for example, for large values that are good and for continuous measures, let's say I do the, the uh, review of the literature and I find that the confidence interval compared to reference to placebo is 4.5 to 8.5. So then the margin is minus 4.5. This is the minimum of the reference effect. And if I want to preserve 50% of it, then I just multiply by a half. So I get minus 2.25. And so I set a margin that preserves, uh, that would be minus 2.25. If I want to preserve 75%, then it, the margin would be lower, okay? And so therefore you can see that the if I want to preserve a lot of it, it becomes harder to show, right? So I will, people will want to do this one. Um, in a multiplicative one, it's just, you know, you, you just change things. I just actually made it worse here. I did a large values is bad. So I did it the opposite. And this is just a calculation of how this is bad. Um, I'll, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of this. But we actually just wanted to give you an example. We actually did this in one of our studies that we designed um, when thanks to this uh, investigator to allow me to present it. He had found out that they were kind of comparing uh, aspirin and some factor 11 and this other anticoagulant um, and aspirin was the uh, active control. And they wanted to, to determine what is the margin for this. And so what we did is we, from our meta-analysis, we had 0.62 was the point estimate. Um, and we had the confidence interval was this. So the M1 was minus 0.28%. They wanted to preserve 50% of it. So at two was minus 0.14. And in terms of ratios that it was 1.16, and that's what they were using in the finding. So um, this FDA guidance is the one that I would, uh, suggest that uh, you uh, focus on, okay? If you're interested in non-inferiority trials. Okay, so just to summarize the different types of hypothesis and a recommended way of interpreting the 95% confidence interval is that, um, so this delta two, I should change it to gammas, but this is delta one is the capital delta, and this is little delta. So, you know, Depending on your hypothesis, if, for example, if you are between the, the minus gamma and plus gamma, you would say that you're equivalent. Um, but if you go beyond that, because this is very close to that, you could say it's inconclusive equivalent, so you'd have to say not equivalent. Um, you would say this is, um, if you're testing for superiority, Yes, this may be statistically significant, but it's not meaningfully superior. It doesn't even come close to what you considered in the design as a minimum clinically important difference. Um, and so this one, it's not significant, but it's, you know, the, the point estimate is over here. So it's inconclusive superiority. Um, this is, the point estimate is above this, so it's superior and it's significant, but this one is, significantly superior because you compared it to this one here. So they're all these, if you're testing for superiority, this would be probably the, what you're hoping for. If you're testing the other way, then you get the similar interpretations here. Okay. 
So people don't usually focus on confidence intervals, but they should. The only time to focus on confidence intervals is in non-inferiority studies. Okay, so in the last half hour, I wanna talk about the, um, this, this is the hypothesis that we have, and I would like to now talk about the study designs of clinical trials. And there's some standard common proper designs that are used that I'll talk about. So number one is the basic simple two arm parallel concurrent trial. Here we have um, that we uh, have a target population is who we want to study, but we have to get eligible people that consent to participate. And this is the sample that we have in a trial. These people are randomly assigned to intervention unless in the two arm, we have these two groups. So we call this one arm and this is the other arm. Then we follow them up prospectively and then evaluate the occurrence of the event of interest or the outcome of interest at a specific time point. And some people will have, uh, if it's, we're focusing on the occurrence of an event, they will have it or not have, or we'll be measuring. Usually, as I said, the outcomes are rarely, or, or sometimes very, very rarely, continuous measurements. They tend to be more occurrence or not of an event. Okay. Um, sometimes um, it is advantageous or possible to do a crossover design. And a crossover design means that when we have the people randomize initially, they get A and B. And after we've observed this, after a certain period of time, when the effect of the interventions is considered to be washed out, so there's another period of washout, then the people that had gotten A first now get B, and the people that have gotten B first now get A. Some people call this a um, two arm because this is one arm and this is another arm because you don't re-randomize people. You've randomized them to this arm or to this arm and they call, sometimes call it the two stage uh, study, two arm, two stage. But it's really another one, if you're crossing over, you're crossing over. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing a crossover design? Well we can get more efficiency, right? Because the same number of patients are being used. And so you increase your sample size and it's fantastic because uh, you, get, you get that, right? You have subjects also are their own control. And because variability is less than among subjects, you get an increase in precision. So in the absence of a carryover effect, it is more efficient. If there are carryover effects, then it's a problem. Right, so that's the limitation. So the carryover effects must be considered in the design by having a washout period. And this may not be possible. There may be something, you know, once you've intervened, people, if it's a drug and the drug is out of your system and doesn't have any le uh, lasting effects, then it's possible. But if it's anything else, like if it's an intervention on, um, physical activity, once you're trained to do something, well, you're, you're not gonna forget it. So there's things, it's not always possible to do. Um, however, because responses within subjects are correlated, um, you will have lower variability. So that's a good thing um, to do, but you have to take into account that you have repeated measures within the person, right? Uh, this also helps recruitment and adherence because some people, if one of the interventions is placebo, people don't like it. And you say, no, no, everybody's going to get the intervention. Some people are going to get it before others. Okay. Um, however, the carryover effects are confounded with the intervention by period interaction. And if there is a period effect, you have to take that into account. Okay. And they usually are longer duration. And so people sometimes will drop out. They just don't like it. Or it's much more costly to do because it's a longer duration. 
sometimes we do incomplete crossovers. And why do we do that? Is that um, if it's sometimes it's if it's placebo, we say no, no, everybody's going to get it. But people that have given been given the intervention, we just don't give them placebo. We just stop them there, and we get then what's called an incomplete crossover design. And basically, it's done mainly to increase recruitment. Um, you don't get any increased efficiency by using the patient. So you still analyze, you actually will look at this as a secondary outcome. You look at this effect and you don't gain any efficiency because you compare this to this. And later you can say, well, maybe I compare this to this and call it delayed intervention versus early intervention. So you can answer two questions uh, at the same time. Another very common uh, one that is used is a factorial design. Um, and this is considered when we have multiple possible interventions that act differently. So we wanna say, ah, does this drug work if we do a dietary supplement versus we don't do a dietary supplement? And um, in the, so I have the, let's say the drug is yes, versus no, and then the okay. dietary supplement is yes versus no. no. Um, can everybody mute, mute themselves, please? Whoever is talking, can you please mute yourself? Um, and so why do we do this? The factorial designs are essentially um, a uh, parallel design with four arms. But the reason we do it is that in the absence of interactions, we are increasing the efficiency because we're now studying two interventions at the same time, okay? Um, but it also allows us to, in the presence of interactions to study the interactions. And so we can then focus on the marginal distributions here, I go back, I could look at um, the intervention B efficacy in the absence of any interaction, I can just look at the two N people here versus the two N people here and answer, does B work? And then the same thing in the absence of interactions, I can look at the effectiveness of A by comparing two N versus two N um, and see if A works. So I can answer two questions with the same study. And that's why people like to do it. But it has limitations, right? I cannot have the mechanisms of action be the, the, set, the same. So if there are two dietary things, I cannot have that. Uh, I, whoever's not muted, please mute yourself. Interventions must be able to be administered jointly. That means that you don't have um, this uh, synergistic effect of administration. So if one is um, a nutrition one and one is an education one, can I do nutrition and education at the same time without modifying them or do I have it? They should also not have adverse effects. Like if there's two different types of drugs that are possible. One is an anticoagulant and another one is an antithrombotic uh, drug. Well but they are both cause bleeding. And if I give both of them at the same time, then I have cumulative lots of bleeding. No, I cannot do that. Um, and it also should be ethical to give placebo, placebo, or no drug, no drug, or no, the control arm for both should be ethical to be done. Okay. Um, so they have limitations, but it's very attractive to do this. So for example, we had, uh, a study we were looking at in functional bowel disease. And it was uh, in women that had irritable bowel syndrome and they had a antidepressant called the cipramine and they had a psychiatric treatment of cognitive behavioral therapy were the two types of treatments that we're looking at. So um, they did an incomplete factorial design why? Because it was not considered ethical to not do anything, which is to not give A and to not give cognitive therapy. So the no-no was not possible. 
but we did then an incomplete factorial design. Now, sometimes we even have, and very, very, very rare, is a combination of crossover and factorial. And um, this was uh, drugs for hypertension that was being done when it's philodipine and candesartan. And they was able to give the two drugs together. So they had, this was the factorial part, A, B, C, D, but they did it in a crossover. So initially in a one period, they got A, B, C, D, and the people that got A, then they had a washout period, and then they were crossed to B, and then after another washout period to C, and then around to D. And what they did is a very complex design that actually was a traditional Latin square design. And who developed these techniques for experimentation? Sir Ronald Fisher on treating interventions for plants in agriculture. So all of these complex designs, there are many more complex experimental designs done in um, plants, in agriculture, in animal studies, and in, uh, in vitro studies. Those types of experiments can have multiple designs. Um, in fact, the books on designs of experiments consider all sorts of two to the K factorial, uh, et cetera, type designs. All of those complex designs are possible. However, in humans, because of many of the issues of carryover effects and of treatments and of ethics, we tend to do very, very, very simple designs, like the two-arm cross, uh, two-arm, the factorial, the crossover. We may do three-arm because we may have, let's say, four doses versus a control. But so we may have five arms, et cetera. So we have these sorts of things, but we don't do the very complex experimental designs that is done in other fields of application of statistics. Okay. What we do many times is what's called adaptive designs. And what are adaptive designs? Adaptive designs are designs of studies that use data as it's accumulating in a study to decide how to modify aspects of the study without affecting the validity and integrity of the trial, okay? So validity is that we still get correct statistical inferences, and integrity is that we can still enable us to convince people of a broader scientific community. So people call this by different terms. They call it flexible design, response-driven, dynamic trials, or self-designing, or multi-stage trials, so two-stage, three-stage, et cetera. So adaptive designs are things that are adaptive by design. It's not ad hoc that you just, oh, Things are not going well, let's change it. No, adaptation is a design feature, something that you specified beforehand. It's not a remedy for poor planning. So you want to conduct your trial in several stages with access to the data. And you can change what? You can change many things, but you specify beforehand what you're going to change and how. So you can change how you allocate people. Oh, because the treatment is going better, I'm gonna allocate more to Please put yourself on mute, whoever is not on mute. Um, you can change how many subjects will be sampled at the next stage, like if you want to increase your sample size or when you're going to stop. So we talk about interim analysis on Saturday, and that is actually an adaptive design, is when to stop the trial. Um, or you may have some decision pertaining to a design change not covered by any of the previous three here. So at any stage, the data are analyzed and at the next stages redesigned, taking into account all available data. So I uh, can give you some examples of uh, the stopping rule is what's called the group sequential designs. We'll talk about that. Um, response adaptive allocation is an allocation rule that people use that if you get better response in one arm, after a particular time. Now, instead of doing one-to-one -one allocation, you're going to do two-to-one, for example, or three-to-one, uh, favoring the people that are doing better. Um, or sample size recalculation is, is, is another one of them. So it's 
the, there's all sorts of flexible designs that are being done. This is a big topic unto itself, so I'm not going to go into uh, much detail at all, but I wanted to recommend, again, a, a very good uh, volume of the Journal of Biopharmaceutical Statistics. It's now getting to be a little bit old, but it is a very comprehensive discussion, multiple papers, well-written uh, on adaptive designs, okay? And there was a pharma working group that came up with this. So I have left 10 minutes for questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Hello. Hello. Yep. Yes, uh, good yes. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, it's a very nice presentation, doctor. I have one question. Uh, in a crossover design, uh, how to consider carryover effect while doing statistical analysis? While doing it, no. So what what you do? Oh, you mean when at the end of the study you are now <clears throat> considering the carryover effects, right? Yes. So doctor, you have mentioned uh, that okay. you have to consider the carryover effect in the design stage as well as in the analysis stage. In the design stage, we are going to give uh, some gap uh, between the- washout period. Washout period, yes, exactly. How to uh, consider it in the designing, I mean, the analysis stage, doctor? Yeah, so, so there are multiple ways of doing it. One way of doing it is to consider a, each period as, you're gonna get an outcome for the person. So you have repeated measures within a person, right? And so the uh, carryover effects of the previous periods, you can do it with a lag effect, or you can do it as in a, you know, in a mixed model, you will have the repeated periods within a person or repeated outcomes within a person. And you can now include a um, the, whatever, how you've assessed the, the carryover effect is another variable in that model, because you're gonna just do, let's say you have three periods, you will have three measurements on each person, right? But then the baseline value for that period is another variable you put in the model. That makes sense? Uh Yes, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Raised our question. Thank you, Thomas, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Wangdiwala, for that nice presentation and taking us through. Uh, my doubt is with regard to the non inferiority trial and setting uh, margins. Uh, so uh, you, you can, I there, so can there be a preference between considering a ratio versus absolute difference in outcome? So the trouble is when there are uh, when the outcomes are of uh, are rare occurrences. So would you really go in for a ratio or look at difference in outcome, absolute difference in outcome? Mm -hmm. So you know statistically, absolute differences are much better for me personally, than ratios. Unfortunately, I work with physicians who prefer ratios. And so like the example that I gave you with uh, uh, the um, determining of the margin um, for the, the anticoagulant study, um, the physician, uh, Dr. Eichelblum, he preferred ratios, but I said, I'm going to work on absolute. And once I figured it out on the absolute, then I will just take the, you know, the reciprocal uh, to, uh, not the reciprocal, I'll take it, make it as a ratio. And because they understand ratios better than absolute differences. Um, so from a mathematical or statistical distributional standpoint, absolute values, absolute differences are, are preferred over ratios. However, what you, you raise another issue. You're raising the issue of what happens in rare events. Uh, and so if you have rare events, um, the ratios are even further distorted. 
And so it's, it's a cautionary thing. So I would personally still continue to use absolute differences. Um, but um, in rare events, it is, uh, and especially in rare events as well. Thank you very much. There's some questions in the chat. Hi, sir. I'm John. Mm -hmm. Hi, John. My question also on with the uh, non inferior BS. Um, I'm also working with Dr. Pink, and uh, in recent of our thing, uh, we had two primary endpoints, and uh, we used two different methods to fix the non infertility margin. One is 50% of the lower cutoff, another one is the absolute. Is it possible in the same trial for two endpoints to use two different methods to fix the primary, uh, the inferiority margin? So if you have two different endpoints and you're considering them as two... Yeah. Two different uh, outcomes, let's say. Two different outcomes, okay. So if you have two different outcomes and you basically what you're trying to do is to um, use the same study to answer two different research questions. Um, normally in clinical trials, if you have multiple outcomes of interest, you still design a study based on one to be the primary outcome. Um, so the margins and the non-inferiority uh, decisions, et cetera, are established for the primary one. However, if you have two that you want to consider as primary, then we are in a different situation. We call that having co-primary outcomes. And if you have co-primary outcomes, again, the if you go to that FDA guideline that I mentioned, they have rules for co-primary outcomes. And co-primary outcomes for them requires that you show that you, if you want to use the term co-primary, that the intervention is not inferior for primary one and for, for outcome one, as well as for primary outcome two. And that if it is works for one, but not for two, it doesn't work. That's what the FDA says, to use the word co-primary. So co-primary is a really sticky terminology that regulatory agencies and their bureaucratic formal ways of doing things uh, stipulate. But if you have two, you have multiple primaries and you don't call them co-primary, so you have now two, then people do this thing about splitting the alpha and says, okay, I have 0.05, but I want to study two, two outcomes. So now I'm going to do a non-inferiority study on this one, but instead of at the 95%, this is gonna be at the 97.5. And this one, I'm also going to do as the 97.5. So I'm now doing two studies in one, but I'm splitting the alpha. And then some people, some clinicians will argue, well, why are there different outcomes? Why do I have to split the alpha? I'm just taking advantage of having the data and doing it. So some people don't split the alpha. So you can do it. So the answer to your question, the long answer is yes, you can do it. There is no problem, except there is a big exception. Where is the exception? How do you regulate the monitoring of the study? Because now the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, we will talk about on Saturday, has to decide, what if I've already shown non-inferiority in one? Do I let the study continue to study the other one? Or is it what? So having those two, it becomes problematic. And that's why people only do one as opposed to two. But statistically, yes, yeah, of course you can. Yeah, but uh, in the infertility, fixing of the non infertility margin, you said two rules, no? 50% and 75% of the confidence, lower bound. Yeah. So is it okay to choose uh, two, diff uh, two different things for two different outcomes? That's the question. Oh, 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 yeah, you can choose different ones. That's not a problem. Okay, okay. Yeah. thanks. Yeah, sorry, I didn't understand your question. Yeah. 
there were some other questions in the chat. Hold on. So Zinia said, in a study, if we can't see the effect of the vitamin, we can be considered to monitor the Hello? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, sir. This is Ashish. Uh, mm -hmm. Sir, my question is that uh, as it uh, you have answered it, but I just want few um, few more uh, information that if suppose uh, we are having a measurement on risk and disease and the absolute difference is not significant, but the ratio difference is coming out to be significant in our RO or OR form. So what uh, precautions we should take before making the inference? I did not understand the question. Can you repeat? Yes, sir. I am saying that suppose we are checking the association between the risk factor and a, a disease, and uh, the absolute difference which we are getting is not significant, but the relative difference which we are getting is significant. So what precaution, as you have told that absolute uh, measure is more important, but uh, the, unfortunately we are not getting it as a significant one. So what uh, precaution we should take before making the inference based on the uh, ratio measures? So, you know, whether you transform the, the outcome from a ratio to, you know, by two ratios versus keeping it as an absolute would usually not change the statistical significance of it. It may change what the effect size is or appears to be. Right, because you may say, "Oh, it's a um, the percent difference in absolute change is three percent, but when I take the ratio, it is uh, sixteen percent or whatever." But the statistical significance would not change necessarily. Um, that's one point, and the second point is that in because of the potential of different analytic methods giving you different results, the, it is formally required to register the protocol of your clinical trial before you start recruiting the first patient. So you have to have your protocol finalized and the protocol includes your statistical analytic plan. So how are you are going to do it, whether you're going to do it one way or another, you have to register it. And there are uh, places uh, worldwide where you can do it. The WHO has a registration place, the uh, clinicaltrials.gov in the United States does it. Anybody anywhere in the world can register for free their trial protocol and must do it if you want your study to be recognized by regulatory authorities in your country, as well as by any serious journal. So most journals, when you submit the result of a clinical trial, they will ask, please give us your registration number and um, they will not accept it otherwise. And so um, when you do that, the reviewers go and see, oh, when they registered, they said they were going to do it this way, the analysis, and they've not done it this way. So they reject your paper. So you have to pre-specify. You cannot start playing around and you know, finding out, oh, let me transform the data this way. Let me do this, let me do that. The usual tricks that people do to fish for significance is something that is not allowed in the clinical trial uh, um, situation. Why? Because clinical trials, again, as I said at the beginning, are looked upon as the potential to change clinical medical practice and on humans. And so because they can do that, um, people and regulatory agencies worldwide are very careful. They don't allow people to do all this messing around with data and tricks that people like to do. Uh, clinicians and statisticians to get significance. So be be aware of this. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm.
So somebody asked here, is the calculation of sample size similar for a crossover as well as for an incomplete crossover? No, they're not. Because the crossover, you get higher efficiency. Uh, an incomplete crossover is the calculation is just if you have what you are ignoring the second part, you're just doing it for the first part. So the calculation for an incomplete crossover is like if you did not do a crossover. There's a new message. So the question is, do you have to register if you are comparing one nutritional intervention with another? Um, my advice is why not register? Um, registration is, first of all, has many benefits because it makes you think about how you're going to analyze your data before you see the data. And so it assures people that are reading your paper that you uh, thought about things beforehand um, and you followed what you thought. And this is the way things should be done. You're testing the hypothesis. We are not doing all the stuff that we are criticized of doing when we do observational studies, right? That, oh yeah, you can lie with statistics. So they did this because they, they did 50 or 70 or 80 models and now they're presenting one. No, you will see that when you, when you analyze a clinical trial and what you publish, if you go to the New England Journal paper on the uh, uh, vaccine for COVID, you'll see the analysis is extremely simple. There's nothing really complicated that they did, right? Um, and so uh, registration helps you get into good journals as well. Um, it doesn't have to be just for regulatory agencies uh, on drugs. I would register it if it's a nutritional or an educational intervention. As long as you're doing a trial and you want to show that you're seriously doing this, registration is a good idea. There is a question from Tinku. Sorry, if, uh, I'm not exceeding time. Just one question. With regard to the, um, the toxicity and the response ratios that you were mentioning, Dr. Bangiwala, in, in, when we consider preventive strategies, uh, would it be right for us to say that we will uh, tolerate no toxicity at all? Uh, right, so now, now you're, you, but your outcome is a good one, right? So, or not toxicity is a bad thing. So you wanna prevent toxicity um, and you want to have lower values of toxicity, right? Or am I not understanding? Yes. Um, uh, how do you strike the balance is my actual question. Because when you are thinking about preventive strategies, like this example here of nutritional interventions, uh, nutritional supplementation, uh, mm -hmm. your tolerance for toxicity would be much, much lower as compared to, or almost null with no toxicity. How, how do you set those? Oh, OK. So, so I want to clarify one thing. Um, when I was talking about toxicities, et cetera, that's when your primary outcome is toxicity. But let's say in your nutritional intervention, your primary outcome is not toxicity. Your yes. primary outcome is some benefit, right? Um, that you get um, a higher, uh, level of, I don't know, some nutrient in your body, right? So you have higher protein or something, but you want to, you have a toxicity is an adverse effect. So you design the trial, the, um, the test of hypothesis is for the primary outcome. It's not for the adverse effects. If toxicity is an adverse effect and not your primary outcome, then what you want to do, and this is not something that is done very well, is that they do all the design, et cetera, on the primary outcome. And they say, we will look at toxicity and adverse effects as well, 
but they don't include it in the statistical hypothesis testing situation. They look at it um, in a very ad hoc, uh, simplistic way, and they'll say, oh, the effect is such and such, but we also had a little bit of toxicity. Um, and they will just report it in a separate table and say, yes, we, that we had an example, for example, uh, in, in cardiology, we were doing a, a drug to prevent um, heart attacks and strokes, um, but it causes bleeding because it basically it's a blood thinner, it's an anticoagulant. So we said, okay, yeah, it, it does benefit. We reduce the number of heart attacks. We reduce the number of strokes. We reduce the number of people that die of, of, heart, of coronary disease. But there is some bleeding. And then we report the bleeding. And they said, well, yeah, we had you know, a few cases of excess bleeding, but it was not serious bleeding. And we had this percent here and this percent that, but that's not, that's like the toxicity, right? It's a separate outcome. It's a safety outcome. And the safety outcomes are analyzed separately from the efficacy outcomes. People are trying to combine things and say, oh, but I want to get a new outcome that is a combination of the efficacy things and the safety things. And um, they call that the net benefit outcome. So if you look in the literature, clinical literature, they're talking now about not just the efficacy outcome and the safety outcome separately, but they're looking at you know, this minus this. So that's called the net benefit. And so is there a net benefit of this intervention? It is something that is being uh, written up in the clinical literature. It is, it, uh, is not necessarily that well accepted, uh, but some people are doing that sort of stuff. But the typical, most common thing to do is to have your efficacy outcomes separately from your safety outcomes. And the efficacy outcomes are analyzed statistically rigorously. The safety outcomes are sort of looked at um, but not really, there's no statistical hypothesis that is driving those, those things. Thank you. I, I think this is quite important, especially with the COVID vaccines, because uh, you know the Oxford vaccine later turned out that it, it causes blood clots in the brain and so on. So that was kind of mm -hmm. the initial phases of the trial of the vaccine itself. But once, right. was, yeah. Yeah, and so and, and you know, and the reason they, they probably did not do a net benefit is because they would have been criticized because the clotting was so 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 rare that it didn't really affect the other one, right? And so they would have said, "Well, why are you focusing on uh, ignoring the clotting? Why don't you report it separately?" And so that's what they did. Um, I don't know. I'm just guessing because I was not involved with it, but that the clots actually are really, really very small in number. And, uh, um, but they had to report it. And because they reported it separately and did not hide it into a net benefit, that was okay. But then they got criticized. Oh yeah, you have clotting. But you know, it's one in a hundred thousand. And they, what they failed to do, I think this is their, their um, media people were not good is saying, you know, the adverse effects here are so much lower than adverse effects of things that already people accept uh, happen, right? Because you do get these issues in other uh, types of uh, drugs as well, but people ignore them because they're very, 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 very few. But a good point. Thank you. Okay. So I'm actually late for another uh, Yeah. Meeting that uh, I thank have, you, so I think I'm going to say yeah, thank goodbye. You. Yeah. Okay, very nice of you. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay, see you guys tomorrow. All right, bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Pretty much.